unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Psalms 34. Uh, Psalms 34, we're going to begin from the first verse. The Bible says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, and I'm reading the Amplified Version, shall continually be in my mouth. My life makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble and afflicted hear and be glad. Verse 3 says, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought, the Bible says, inquired of the Lord, and required him of necessity and on the authority of his word, and he had me and delivered me from all fears. They looked to him, those who believed, and were radiant, and their faces shall never blush for shame or be confused. Glory to God. Today I want to talk about a very interesting mind that has come across lately in my personal fellowship with the Lord recently. He's uh, been impressing it on my heart to share so much on the reason why we have people who perpetually live a life of fear. Okay, sometimes you've probably woken up in a state of a circumstance or an experience that threw you off guard and distracted you off the course of faith and, you know, threw you into a very crazy mode of despondency and all hope was lost. I've been around people in my years of counseling where some people have received the worst news from doctors, some have received the worst news from uh, their spouses, some have received the worst news from their parents and some from their own children and some have received very bad news at their workplaces and there's many forms of things that can come our way and sometimes they hit so hard, they hit so hard. And when everything is going on straight and not proper and direct you, you might never understand it until something hits you so bad that it will throw you off balance and the fear that would grip your soul. Some people even fail to feel their own feet when they are in that kind of state. And so we've had experiences in life where I've seen believers who are so shaken and shuddered. And sometimes when the Spirit of God is ministering to us, we tend to take certain things as simple and straightforward as they appear. And, and one of those days I was, you know, relating with the Spirit. And he said, but why are people afraid? Of course, I gave my answers, which I knew were aligned to the Word of God, and I was right. But he said, but I ask because I want to also show you another side of why people live in fear, you know. And the Lord told me, when you find a Christian, when you find a believer who is living in perpetual fear, in constant worry, in constant anxiety, in a restlessness and an insecurity, and an anticipation of wrong happening or hitting shipwreck in a certain form of way, the Lord told me that is a Christian who has not exercised themselves to seek me the way they have to seek me. As simple as that sounded, when I went so deep into searching out what the Lord meant, he began to break these things down for me slowly by slowly, and of some of which I'm going to share in this sermon tonight to help us understand that when you learn to seek God a certain way, fear will leave. Fear will leave. And sometimes it's not that some are perpetual, and some just wake up and you are okay. You are walking your life of faith right. You are living this life of salvation, you know, in the right course. But something happens and it could throw you off. It could simply throw you off. But if that should continue one day, two, three, four days, that is only proof, more so when you still feel insecure and unsettled and anxious and afraid in your spirit. It means that you have not learned how to seek God or you have not sought God as you ought.
And that is what Psalms 34 is trying to tell us. If you read again from the fourth verse, right? He says, I sought and inquired of the Lord and required him of necessity and on the authority of his word, and he had me. I sought the Lord and he had me and delivered me from all my fears. Delivered me from all my fears. Underline the word all my fears. All my fears. All your fears. God's mind is not to deliver you from one and then leave you in another or deliver you from the easy and more tolerable and then let you, you know, slip down into a more destructive one. No, God intends for you to be delivered from all fear. That if anything comes ahead, no matter what lies ahead of your life, there is a way you will learn and align yourself to God's word and will and purposes enough that you will find that in the most threatening experiences, you'll be strong. You'll be strong. And I believe that some of you believers watching me right now, you've been through something and some of you are still going through some issues. Have you ever been at a point where you are so amazed at how strong in the inside you are and how you know, fortified and garrisoned you are in, in your spirit. And I want to explain why it is so. But I also want to establish somebody into a life of constant strength in your spirit. When Paul is praying for the church in Colossians, he says, I pray that you might be strengthened in your inner man through the Holy Spirit. God wants your inner man to be at a certain strength, at a certain establishment, at a certain fortification. He wants that man to be strong your inner man to be strengthened, you know, that nothing shakes regardless of whatever happens outside your life. You have a strength within your inner man. Some people have an outward look of confidence. They have an outward look, we got this, you know, I got this. But inside they're shaken, they're broken, they're torn people. They're wasted within with fear. And every other moment they leave to the next day and the next year and the next month anticipating some bad or ready to react to something bad as those who have not understood God. But I love that he says that when I sought the Lord, and the KJV said, I sought the Lord and he had me and delivered me from all my fears. No man who seeks God fears. Or if you learn to seek God a certain way, you will learn not to fear. 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 It takes the Spirit of God to instruct a man into the boldness of the Spirit. There's a common scripture, of course, we are reading in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7. And it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That God has not given it to us. But you see, I was studying that scripture and I went into the Greek translation to study these words because there's something the Spirit of the Lord was throwing me into in my questions with God. And I see that when you read the word given, okay, for the Lord has not given, for God has not given, the Greek word there is didomi, didomi, he has not given. And what does it mean? He has not ministered fear to us. He has not yielded us. To fear. He has not committed us to fear. He has not committed you to fear. He has not yielded you to fear. He has not ministered fear to you. The Lord has not ministered fear to you, but he has ministered power, he has ministered love, and he has ministered a sound mind. Let me show you how deep this is. Sometimes as the ministers of the gospel, the Bible has been very clear in the instruction we have before God as ministers. It says, brethren, for those of us who desire to be ministers or masters, we should take a deeper heed because greater judgment awaits us, all right? We desire, many of us, to be ministers of the gospel, but the Bible speaks of people who desire to be teachers, you know, of this message of the law. Not knowing what they're saying, the Bible says, and neither knowing from whence they affirm these things. Some people don't know what they're saying when they're ministering the gospel. And unfortunately, some believers, again, in that place of ministry, do not even carry the affirmation from where they preach and minister these things. If God said, I have not given you the spirit of fear, I have not ministered fear to you, 
but have ministered power, love, and a sound mind. Get this. No minister of the gospel should minister to people in fear. Because God has not ministered to us in fear. Some ministers think that when you scare people into obedience, when you scare people into, you know, aligning themselves to do what is right, either morally or spiritually or, you know, I've seen it, I've seen it. I've seen sometimes when ministers can get to a place where we scare people and minister fear to their spirits so we can cause them to either obey or we can cause them to walk in line with what we think we ascribe to as a way of helping men walk in the righteousness with which God has given them. But does that now surprise us why the body of Christ is asking questions around where is the power that is supposed to be imminent in the church of Jesus Christ? Are we now surprised why we don't see a certain glory? Maybe just maybe we need to get back to understanding exactly how did God minister the present ministry of Jesus Christ? Because we have to first understand him from the spiritual, the rock from which they drank, that light. He existed. The Spirit of Christ was in supply even before he came in the flesh. But when he comes in the flesh and is dead and is raised to glory, that dispensation is changed. We enter another page and many of us have not embraced the present ministry of Jesus Christ. Many New Testament creations, many New Testament believers connect to Jesus Christ in an Old Testament dispensation. They see him as he walked, not as he is. And may I add that Jesus's life on the earth before he was crucified and raised from the dead all of that synopsis, all of that story, all of that history was all tagged to the Old Testament. Jesus was still under the Old Testament. He was a man under the law because the fullness of that dispensation had not come. It was only equated to the fulfillment after his death and resurrection. Some people don't know that Jesus Christ lived in the Old Testament dispensation, even though he was the son of God and was 100% God. And so there are things that even though in the times of the Christ, we can allude to, we can connect with in the faith as of to connect to the anointing, you know, as of to connect to the way and mind of the spirit. But there are also things we might not be able to connect to because they are of the other dispensation. They are of the old dispensation. They are of the other covenant. And for the new covenant creation, it will not be able to define you. Because when you become a new creation in Christ Jesus, all things are past and all things have become new. But unfortunately, some of those things have been shifted from the Old Testament dispensation and have come into the New Testament as traditions. And now the word of God is made without effect because of our very own traditions. When the Bible says this is love made perfect, that we might have confidence on that day, for as he is, so are we in this world. When the Bible says for as he is, that's a definition of a glorified being, Christ, given a name above every name, that at the sound of that name every knee bows. There was an elevation in the name from the time when he was raised from the dead. When he humbled himself as unto the cross, yes, he was Jesus Christ, that's true. But there was an elevation of glory in that name when he humbled himself as unto the cross and died. For the Bible says because of that, he was given a name above every name that at the sound of that name, every knee bows of the things in the earth and the earth and in heaven and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. There was an elevation. You must know how the present truth Christ ministers, the ministry of Christ in present truth. If we understood that reality, many ministers would not minister the things we are ministering or are here ministered on our altars today. And some of which, because they are reasonable, right, and can be connected to, you know, usual human experiences, some of these are making sense as truth. And these are the things that are killing our brethren. These are the things that are killing our brethren. One time I had a minister who made a statement and he said, oh, there's a, an experience that we have seen in these days where faith preachers are preaching too much faith that they have not prepared people to survive when calamity befalls them, to survive when hard times come. In my heart, I was like, oh my God, did this man of God hear what he just said? 
So he was judging a faith minister for not preparing men for disaster. Hello? Hello? Can you even think about it? That I get my Bible to open to prepare men for disaster? If I teach you a message that is preparing you for disaster, what am I directing you into? Disaster. 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 I can teach a message to sustain you in your faith amidst the challenges, but I cannot teach you a message that would help you lose in disaster. Because some of them, I think their mind is, for example, uh, one of them uh, was saying, oh, you know, uh, some people play God. Some people play God. Eh? So they think that everything has to go their will. He gave an example and said, for example, if you've been believing God for healing, and then the healing for one year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and then that healing doesn't go away, eh? don't you think that maybe it's not God's will for you to heal? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I had questions in my heart about this minister for so many years. Until on one of those occasions, this minister made a confession on the same set one day that he had been battling an illness for a very long time, for many years. So I said, ah, okay, this is what happened. Disease, you know, consumed the minister for so many years that it made this minister change his doctrine. It made this great man of God change his doctrine concerning God. And now instead of teaching men the faith of divine healing, we're teaching them the grace that sustains them without healing until they die. Jesus Christ came with a message. Voices can die, but the message stays. He did his ministry for three years as a voice and left the earth, but his message stayed. And in every dispensation, that message is marching on triumphantly to the next dispensation, handed over to worthy and faithful men who teach it to others also. That message is that Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. His heart towards humanity has been salvation. He wills that all men be saved and that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. There are many people who are carrying disease in their bodies because they think it is the will of God to be sick. There are many people who are going through sufferings, unnecessary sufferings, because they think it is the will of God. They struggle through one year, two years, 20 years, 30 years, and then they say, oh, maybe I need to come to terms to the God who can give me grace to carry my illness until I die. But even though we are teaching that, it's not the truth. Oh, but why is it that I never got healed? That should be the question. Why is it that the man of God or the woman of God or the believer is not healed? Then we can have a conversation around, is God true and every man a liar? Does he mean what he says when he says by his stripes you are healed? Does he really mean it? Does he really mean it? When he went about doing good, did he heal all that were oppressed of the devil? Yes, he healed all that were oppressed of the devil. But when things don't work our way, I've seen men who have attacked the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because some of them tried it and it did not work for them or they've never seen it in their ministry. I've seen believers who are attacking divine healing because maybe they've never tried it or it has never worked in their ministry. I've seen uh, some who are against the prosperity of God's own because for them the idea of prosperity has been so uh, diluted into a very inexcusable, lustful picture in the body of Christ. And for some ministers, it has gone to the level of robbery. And so because of that, we're throwing, you know, everything out of the window and saying, no, we don't believe that. And now we are now working backward as the body of Christ to help us go back to the places where we really lost our faith. Where some people really began from to slide off the mind of God concerning their lives. The gospel is very clear. If God has said something, it is true. Regardless of whether it has worked for you or it has not worked for you, it still abides true. It's not wrong and neither does it have variance because it has not worked in your life. No. Never submit your personal experiences to the integrity of God's message. That is deeper than that. It is deeper than that. We have seen believers who have accepted you know, certain things and come to terms with certain things. But what has he said? I have not given you a spirit that has ministered fear. The ministry of the spirit I've given you is of love, 
power and sound mind. Love, power, and sound mind. That means when we're talking about the ministry of the person of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Christ that is released in the earth, it is a spirit that seeks to prove the love of God on all fronts. It is a spirit that seeks to demonstrate the power of God on all fronts. And it is a spirit that seeks to establish the believer in sound mind on all fronts. That is it, nothing less. The kingdom, he said, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. He says that is the kingdom. That is the realm. So when God says, I have not didomied you, I have not committed you to fear, I have not yielded you to fear. When you see yourself afraid, when you see yourself walking in the direction of fear, I want you to know that God has not pushed you there. There is something that is pushing you into the direction of fear. And that's the thing you need to study as a believer. You need to sense in your spirit when fear comes. You can sense the spirit of fear in how you confess, in the words you say, in the way you react and respond to things that are around you, your home, your family, your business, your ministry. You can tell. And when you feel it, that Satan is yielding you to fear, you have to know when to stand your ground and declare and say, look, devil, I know that you are inclining me to a spirit of fear, but that is not what I was given. That is not what was committed to me. That is not God's ministry toward me. And even as the minister, as Fanero Ministries, we cannot teach fear. We cannot be ministers of fear. The church of Jesus Christ cannot be a minister of fear. In this period of COVID, I've seen ministers of fear. I've seen ministers, oh, be careful of this, be careful of that. Yeah, this is going to happen. Oh, be careful of that. Oh, this is this. Oh, it's now saying this is the end time. Listen, even in Thessalonians, the scriptures are clear. Who of us as believers is not anticipating the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Who of us is not looking with joy and anticipation for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John the Revelator says, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We all look upwardly with expectation, joyful expectation of the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, he tells us that even when you see these things take place, he said, do not lose heart, nor your peace. He says, do not lose heart, nor your peace. When you hear plagues, he said, do not lose your heart or peace. When you hear pestilences, when you hear wars and rumors of war, he says, do not lose your peace. Don't lose it. Because we are not ministers of fear. The church of Jesus Christ is not a ministry of fear. It's a ministry that confirms and affirms to the spirits of men just how much God loves them. It is a ministry that confirms to men just how much power is abiding in the believer through Christ, the surpassing greatness of power, immeasurable power that is at work within the believer, it ministers the soundness of mind. The soundness of mind. If you are a minister and you align yourself that way, your ministry cannot fail. Your ministry cannot fail because you are aligned to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you why the church many times finds itself swinging between the flesh and the ministry of the spirit. Why sometimes we find ourselves ministering from a realm of darkness and sometimes functioning in the realm of light. Many of us have not been awakened and have not clearly understood the things touching our nature as a new creation. Firstly, let me first pass this as a reality for some of you to note this, if you will. It's a divine principle of the Godhead not to bestow a gift to anyone or anything that is contrary to the definitive nature of that thing. I'll say it again. It's a principle law of the Godhead not to bestow a gift to anything or anyone if this gift is contrary to the definitive nature of that thing or that person. He cannot give a man beyond what that man is able to bear. It's not in the nature of God. It's not in the nature of God. That is why he did not give the fallen man the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
the Old Testament dispensation is clear. The Spirit of the Lord used to come upon the prophets of old. All right? But we don't see the baptism, the infill, and the baptismal of the Holy Spirit. We don't see that. Why don't we see it? Because that nature could not contain the Spirit within. There was a necessity that man would be changed. And once that change takes place, then the new nature can embrace the person of the Holy Spirit. But you see, the challenge with many believers is because our eye has been attuned to darkness and the way of darkness. And because we've been attuned to the way of darkness, even when through love God is seeking redemption, because we design not the judgments of the Spirit, we find ourselves inclining back into darkness. And because of that, many are destroyed because we don't understand the judgments of God. I'll give you an example of Jonah. When God sends Jonah to Nineveh, all right, he tells them Nineveh shall be destroyed. Okay, You go tell them that Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Nineveh is going to be overturned. Right? It's going to be overturned. It shall be no more. And then the prophet prophesies that. But if you study, interestingly, the word there for, you know, overturned or judged, the literal word there is actually transformed or changed. So you can actually see the grace of God in the mind he had toward Nineveh, that his mind through the prophet was not to destroy, it was to save. But because the same word used there for overturned or destroyed, for many people, they think it in the realm and understanding of darkness. But as we see through the working of God, we see that this is what brings Nineveh to salvation, and indeed they are changed and turned. They are transformed. Glory to God. Glory to God. I don't know whether somebody caught it. And you see, Jonah had a glimpse of God's mind. That's why he says, no, 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 I know you. If I go and prophesy, to them that they are going to be destroyed. You'll have mercy on them. I know how you think. I know, God, how you function. And because of that, my prophecies will not be fulfilled. Because to Jonah, it's more important for his prophecies to be fulfilled than the mercy of God to go over the lives of fallen men. Even the animals, God had mercy on them. He said they know not their way. Even their animals. He had pain even for the death of their tamed animals. So if you can see that the mercy of God was there, that's why the Bible says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. There cannot be a place where God is releasing a prophetic word and in the end, he's not seeking for the redemption of mankind. Man might refuse that redemption, but God's redemptive hand was always available, even in the time he wanted to judge the world most. He comes to the man and tells him, look, Abraham, I want to destroy these people. He says, but what if they're 20? You see a man dealing with God and haggling with God and bargaining with God to a place where if there's one righteous man in the city, I shall preserve that city because of the righteousness of that one man. That one man. God's love for mankind, he wills that no man perish. It's the same thing, that the very prophetic word through Jonah, that Nineveh shall be overturned, could also be translated that Nineveh shall be changed and transformed. Because when you read that Hebrew translation for that word, it does not necessarily denote destruction. It doesn't necessarily mean destruction. It doesn't necessarily allude to decimation. No, there was a mind of God in this. And it takes a special grace of the Spirit to see that when God is speaking through his prophet that actually Nineveh shall be changed, Yes, the word sounds like judgment, but that's the judgment that is going to bring them to repentance and to the end of God's intention for them that indeed they were changed and transformed into better and God's destruction did not overtake them because he wills that they be saved. But like I said, God cannot give anything or anyone a gift that is contrary to his nature or its nature. It's not in the principles of God. It's not in the principles of God. So to even explain fear, we must understand from which nature we're at. I'll give you an example. In Psalm 64, verses 1, the psalmist makes a prayer. And he says, hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. From fear of the enemy. Preserve my life from the fear of the enemy. 
Now, if the psalmist make that prayer, he's a hundred percent right to pray that he might be preserved from the fear of his enemies. I'll tell you why. Because one, this David, even though he's a man after God's own heart, he's not a new creation. He's not born again. Christ is not yet come in the flesh to become the propitiation of the sin, as of to translate man from darkness to light, from a fallen nature to a new nature in Christ. That was a fallen nature that was already judged from the onset of the fall of Adam and Eve. That fallen nature is aligned to fear. It is tuned to fear. It is connected to fear. It is configured to fear. Its settings are in fear mode. So when David prays and says, preserve my life from the fear of my enemies, preserve me so that I might not fear all my life from the fear of the enemy, he's right to pray because it was in that nature, it is in the nature of the fallen man to actually fear his enemies, to fear what is coming ahead of them. It's in his nature. So he's right to pray. A new creation Regenerated Christian, a born-again believer, a New Testament believer cannot make that prayer because you've not been given fear. So you cannot say, preserve my life from the fear of my enemies. No, you cannot. You cannot. You can't pray that prayer. Why? Because he has not given you. Remember when he says in Romans 8, 15, the Amplified Version, he says, for the spirit which you have now now he's talking about the new creation, born again. When you become born again, he says, the spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you more in bondage to fear. Meaning, before you received this spirit, you were actually enslaved into the bondage of fear. You were enslaved. So if a man is not yet a new creation, is not yet born again, that man would pray to be preserved from the fear of his enemies. But a new creation person, a new creation believer cannot pray to be preserved from the fear of his enemies because the spirit you have received, the Bible says, is not a spirit of slavery to bondage once again to fear. He says, but you have received the spirit of adoption. That's the spirit that is working in every new creation believer. He says that's producing sonship and in the bliss, not in the fear. In the bliss, not in the worry. In the KGV, the word bliss is not put there. But I love that this is emphasized in the Amplified and in the Greek as well. That God says, because you have the spirit of adoption and sonship, in the bliss you cry, Abba, Father. So our cry is not a cry of agony. Our cry is not a cry of anxiety. Our cry is not a cry of fear. No, our cry is a cry of gratitude. Oh, Abba, thank you. Our cry is a cry of gratefulness. Our cry is a cry of victory. Our cry is a cry of triumph. Our cry is a cry of love. Our cry is a cry of breakthrough. Our cry is the cry of an overcomer. That is how we cry. We don't say, oh God, no, we say, oh God, with that joy, with that satisfaction. If you don't understand this, you're in trouble, big trouble, because the Bible says fear hath torment. Fear attracts the spirit of torment. That means you will be tormented by the devil all your life. In John, he says, for there is no fear in love, for perfect love casteth out all fear, because fear hath torment. So when you hear people saying, oh, that child has been tormented by devils, that brother has been tormented by a spirit, that sister has been tormented by this spirit of sickness, that spirit of bondage, that spirit of this. Whatever spirit it is, if it is tormenting you, I want you to understand that behind that is an ounce of fear in your spirit. There is a grain of fear in there. When you deal with that fear, perfect love casteth out of fear. It's not the ministry of anybody, but the person of love to cast out fear. When love fills you, fear leaves you. Fear leaves you. But he has said that I sought the Lord and he delivered me from all fear. If you know how to connect to God, if you know how to connect to his spirit, if you know how to connect to his person, fear will flee. And when fear flees, torment flees. I tell people, the flee of fear will always precede the fleeing of torment. 
Torment will flee where fear is not. Torment cannot stay. Disease cannot stay where fear is not. Bondage cannot stay where fear is not. I don't care whether the doctors have called it any name. If it's not in your mind to accept and be afraid of it, there is a glory that is available for you to deal with even the most complicated thing human history has recorded. Don't think that all the people that are dying of virus right now in the world are dying simply because their bodies are so weak. Some and many of them are actually dying because in midst the sickness there is fear. There is a lot of fear. There is a lot of fear. There are people until they're diagnosed of a disease, even with as much pain, they can leave and then it even clears out of their body. But the day they are diagnosed is the day they start to die. Is the day they start to die. Why? Because the seed of death has been planted in their spirits by a diagnosis. Diagnosis. Yet they have a pignosis. They have the gnosis of God. They have the knowledge of God. God has given an answer to every challenge in the world. And I know why it's so hard for people, for the world, to receive this. It is just so good. It's just so good. It's just so good. That's why it's hard for newspapers to report crusades. It's just so good news. It's hard for newspapers to report healing meetings, even when many do them across the world. Why? It is just so good. It's just so good. Just so good. I know of a person who belongs to the ministry. She studied uh, mass media and all this uh, stuff somewhere in the United Kingdom. And she tells me she went to one of the most successful television networks. You know, and then she wanted to present, you know, a program with them. And they told her, look, we cannot air this because it is too true. It's too true. You understand? It's too true. To air a healing revival meeting, that's so true. It's just not how the goddess Medea works. It's just not how the media of this world works. It's just not how it works. Because it's too good to be true. God is too good, you know, to be true. It's too good. So when he tells you and I that you have not received the spirit, he's now addressing your nature. And so instead of us telling you, stop fearing, I'm actually supposed to tell you that it's not in your nature to fear. The only way to fear is to disconnect your consciousness from your nature in Christ. It's the only way fear can come around you, regardless of how or what is happening in your life. Christians will have challenges like people in the world have them, but there's a difference between us and the world. We go through these things in hope. We go through these things with faith. And we go through these things with the persuasion that it must end. And indeed, it has to come to an end. And it always does, should, must, if we choose to believe God. I have now exercised myself to this consciousness that it's not my nature to fear. That is why now we're going to start redefining the issue of what it means to seek God. What does it mean to seek God? What do we seek when we go seeking? Because some people go on prayer mountains and lament. They add on the book of lamentations. They lament and weep all through, oh God. How long, oh God? How long, oh God? Oh, how long, oh God? How long will I keep up with this, oh God? For once, oh God, give me this, oh God. For once, oh God, now I have cried for so long, oh God. Why don't you change this man, oh God? Oh God, my child, oh God. Oh God, how long will I cry about my job? And then they come after three days and they say, I was on the prayer mountain seeking God. <laughs> no. Let me read you something in Proverbs 133. The Amplified Version says, But whoso hearkens to me, who is that? Wisdom, he says, shall dwell securely. Whoever listens to wisdom shall dwell securely and in confident trust 
And the Bible says he shall be quiet without fear or dread of evil. Wow. Wow. Why are people going on prayer mountains? Why are people seeking apostles for prayer? Why are people seeking prophets? Because they are ignoring what God has told them to seek. Listen to what the Bible has said. This is not me. This is what he has said. He said that whosoever hearkens to me, me, wisdom, he says that person shall dwell securely and in confident trust and shall be quiet without fear or dread of evil. You will not fear when you connect to the wisdom of God. There's a wisdom when it comes in your spirit. Fear leaves. In the realm of the New Testament dispensation, wisdom rules. It's okay to go to your man of God to pray for you, your pastor, your evangelist, your prophet, and what. All of that is okay. But there are places we can't get to as men of God. Because it's not the design of God for us to get there for you. And God has given you an antidote here. Seek wisdom. If you do, he said, you shall be quiet. You shall dwell securely. And he says, and you shall not have any fear or dread of evil. Any fear. God wants you to get to a point where you are not afraid of anything. Anything. Nothing. Whatever comes your way. You know that you know that you know that you'll go through it in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, what a grace. What an understanding. What an understanding. In Proverbs 3, let me amplify it again. Proverbs 3 verses 21. He says, my son, let these words or let the message, let them not escape from your sight. As in don't seek to connect to read the word, all right? But keep sound, he said, godly wisdom and discretion. He says, keep sound and godly wisdom and discretion. That means if you want to live a successful life in the faith, you must constantly keep sound and godly wisdom and discretion. Wisdom is supposed to be a part of you. No man will make it in this dispensation without wisdom. Those days are gone where people just used to come to church and they tell them, this year you are going somewhere and they just scream without knowing where they are going. Those days have come to an end. Where people just go for overnights and they are going around walls that never break. Without the revelation of why the walls of Jericho fell. Without that revelation. Some people don't understand that it was the sound of these trumpets that breaks the walls of Jericho. We're living in a generation where people shout after the walls fall. They don't know how to shout when the walls are still up. And even when you're teaching it, many don't understand that it was this that broke the walls. It wasn't the walls breaking and then the shout. Many of us, our people know how to jubilate on the working, on the doing of the Lord. But many of them have not exercised themselves to rejoice when things are going contrary to the things that they see in an anticipation, in expectation, in the hope that things are going to turn around for them. Many people don't have that muscle. Christians are weeping across the world of many things. They are wailing like babies. You look at them and they're like the world, even worse than the people in the world. No wonder the power of God is not evident in your life if you're that kind of person. Invest in wisdom. Don't take wisdom for granted, he said here. And we continue to say, when you keep sound and godly wisdom, the Bible says, they will be life to your inner self. Remember the strengthening of the inner man? They will be life to your inner self. Godly wisdom will become, and discretion, will be life to your inner self. It will hold your foot. It will underguard you in your inner man. And a gracious ornament to your neck, your outer self, which is your body, which is your body. It's a gracious ornament on your body. That means that's divine health in and out, okay? And he continues to say, then you will walk in your way timidly. No, he said you will walk in your way securely and in confident trust, the Bible says, and you shall not dash your foot or stumble. That means you will not fall into issues. 
<laughs> Glory to God. He says you will not. You will not. There is a guarantee through the word of God to stay above attacks. There's a guarantee through the mystery of God's wisdom to stay above attacks. And it's possible through the word. God is speaking right now. And he continues to say in verses 24, when you lie down, he says, you shall not be afraid. What do I mean by that? I'm talking about people who go to bed and they wake up worried. They wake up because they're disturbed by a thought. They wake up because they're frustrated over something that is not yet moving, their finances, their marriage, their children, their business, their ministry, or whatever. If you are the kind who has been waking up at two because you want a husband at 3 a.m., because you want a child at 4 a.m., because you're believing God for a job, you have a big problem. You are praying the wrong way. You are positioned the wrong way. Your mind is aligned and consciousness to the wrong pattern and don't expect to receive anything from God because your mind is double. He said, when you lie down, the Bible says, you shall not be afraid. Yes, he said, you shall lie down. And the Bible says, and you shall sleep, and your sleep shall be sweet. You'll sleep. He's not saying issues won't be there, no. But you will sleep. Hallelujah, glory to God. You will sleep. And the next verse says, be not afraid of sudden terror and panic. Know of the stormy blasts to the storm, the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For you will be guiltless. So when he says, do not be afraid of sudden terror and panic and COVID and poverty and financial strains. No, he says, when it comes, for you will be guiltless. This thing will not touch you. He says, for the Lord shall be your confidence, firm and strong. And the Bible says, and he shall keep your foot from being caught in a trap, the Amplified says, of some hidden danger. Some hidden danger. It's possible to live the life of salvation out of danger. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's possible to live the life of salvation without danger. It's possible. Do you know how many people in the world anticipate danger? Do you know the meaning of hope? Hope is expectation of some good thing to come. The expectation of good is hope. So there are people who are without hope. They are without hope. They don't expect anything ahead of them. Even when they close their eyes, they don't see. Why? Because you checked on your account and there was zero balance. Because you checked on your career the last you saw and they've laid you off. And so because they've laid you off, you feel there is no hope beyond this. Oh... Oh, no, that's not for you. That's not for you. Awaken your consciousness to the truth that fear is not your nature or that if you should feel it, understand that that is your carnal man that has none to do with your spirit man, your new creation realities in Christ cannot allow because they've not ministered Fear, they've not yielded you to fear. They've not committed you to fear. They've not handed you over to fear. God has not called you to fear. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That is why I'm going to go around these things this whole season. It says, by the time we come out, you are of all men and women most bold concerning anything that pertains you. The church across in many parts of the world is afraid. Even some of the people we counted on to be standing in this spirit, they are afraid. They are ministering fear. Oh, you, you don't know. No, this is the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth. And it's what makes us free. The power of truth is my liberty. It's my freedom in Christ. There's somebody watching me right now, and probably they said, you know, we're not going to be able to work with you because of this season. Let them not work with you. That's their problem. Do not carry even the slightest fear that you will lack. That is not the way of a believer, and neither is it the way of God for you to fail. There is redemption with him. He will redeem you. Regardless of what happens, there's going to come an answer. There's going to come a solution for you. It will come. I don't know how, but it 
always comes for the man who has refused to fear. But if you fear, you're going to attract the torment that will make reality of everything you have feared. Everything you have feared. And that goes on those of you who have marriage issues, those of you whose ministries are troubled, sick children, people who are diseased for a long time and the doctors do not have any diagnosis, you know, for your sickness and you've done all the doctors you could and now you're at a point where you say, I think I don't know, I'm tired. Listen, there is fear behind this. Deal with fear once and for all and you'll see how God will start connecting all these dots and indeed all things start to work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. I shall not fear. You shall not fear. You shall not fear. You shall not fear. Father, we thank you. Wherever you are, I want you to open your mouth and thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank him because you're not afraid. Thank him because perfect love casteth out all fear. Thank him because his glory and grace is working in your life and all things are working together for your good. Just thank him for your family. Thank him for your lives. Thank him for your health. Thank him for the things that you've seen are not working because they are going to start to work. And be not afraid of them not working because they have to work. For all things in him are yea and amen to the glory of God. Father, we thank you. Oh, hare katala bayekusha. Because you're with me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Because you're with me. I will not fear. I rebuke every spirit of fear from your homes, from your businesses, from your heart, from your thoughts, from your body. I paralyze every force of dread and terror. I command it to flee out of your life for good. You will not fear for your child. You will not fear for your spouse. You will not fear for your ministry. You will not fear for yourself. You will not fear for your career. You will not fear for anything, for your education. You will not fear for your food. You will not fear for your raiment, for your clothes. You will not fear for your provision. You will not fear. God settles you regardless of what was happening. God settles you. And right now I decree healing. In the bodies of men and women who are sick right now, there is power, healing power available to heal you. And may God heal you right now in the name of Jesus from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. I sense that God has healed somebody. In the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. If you've made that prayer, you're healed. You're delivered. You're free. For who saw the sun says free. It's free indeed. Now walk in that reality. Walk in that nature. Walk in it. Now if you're there and you're not born again and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Repeat this verse after me if you're there. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm of a new nature, new creation. The old is past. Now the new. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org 
or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.